Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I beg to move. The Government remains committed to tackling tax avoidance, evasion and other forms of non-compliance. Since 2010, it has introduced over 150 new measures and invested over £2 billion in additional funding so as to ensure that the right tax is paid at the right time. These efforts have helped to secure and protect over £250 billion for the UK's public services, which would otherwise have gone unpaid. And they have helped to bring down the tax gap to 4.7% in 2018 to 19, its lowest recorded rate. But there is still work to do. The clauses introduced in this Finance Bill build on our previous reforms in order to clamp down on deliberate non-compliance and make sure that everyone pays their fair share. They include measures to tighten the anti-avoidance rules aimed at those who promote and enable tax avoidance schemes. They also close a loophole in the existing anti-avoidance rule aimed at preventing non-UK resident individuals from claiming relief when they gift business assets to a company controlled overseas. The clauses support HMR's strategy as well on promoting good tax compliance. As an example of this approach, the Government is amending the follower notices regime, which penalises taxpayers who have used avoidance schemes that have been shown to be ineffective, in order to make it fairer for those who comply, while ensuring that the regime remains just as effective at combating avoidance. The Finance Bill also seeks to bring parts of the hidden economy out of the shadows by making some licence approvals conditional on tax registration and compliance. Uh, the clauses in this bill are necessarily technical, and that is in part down to the complex rules which are currently in place. Again, given the number of issues that we are covering and the number of other speakers in this debate, I will keep my remarks fairly brief. Mr Chair, Clause 30 and Schedule 6 introduce changes to tackle abuse of the Construction Industry Scheme. <clears throat> the Construction Industry Scheme is a revenue protection scheme designed to tackle evasion in the construction sector. The scheme protects approximately £7.1 billion in tax every year by requiring contractors to make deductions from the payments they make to subcontractors that they engage. These payments count as advance payments towards those subcontractors' tax and national insurance. The changes made by Clause 30 will allow HMRC to correct uh, employers' CIS deductions when they are false or incorrect. Clause 30 will also clarify the deductions as to costs for materials and change the rules for determining which businesses will need to operate the CIS. It also expands the scope of the current penalty for providing false information to HMRC. Mr Chair, Opposition Amendment 74 would remove paragraph 4 of Schedule 6 to this Bill. This would have the effect of removing the proposed, proposed changes to rules for the deduction of materials. However, there is a clear case in public policy for these changes. Some contractors and subcontractors <clears throat> are interpreting the rules incorrectly at present in a way that undermines the purpose of allowing materials deductions within the scheme. And this also, uh, in turn, allows some contractors and subcontractors an advantage over others. The proposed rule changes will ensure a clear and consistent approach, providing a level playing field for those involved. I therefore urge the House to reject Amendment 74. Amendment 73 proposes to remove paragraph 3 of Schedule 6, which relates to the transitional arrangements between the old and the new rules for qualifying as a deemed contractor. This would mean that many businesses would have to change their business arrangements overnight and would have to go through the process of re-registering for the construction industry scheme under the new rules, as this could be more disruptive and confusing than the proposed transitional arrangements. Uh, I would urge the House to reject this amendment. Amendments 75 and 76 would delay the commencement of this measure to April 22 rather than April 2021. Such a delay would not be appropriate as industry has already been consulted on the changes and any impacts are expected to be limited. Uh, again, I would urge the House to reject this amendment. Clause 36 and Schedule 7 amend the corporation tax rules governing so-called hybrid mismatches. These rules are intended to tackle aggressive tax planning by multinational companies that seek to take advantage of differences in how countries view entities and financial instruments, so-called hybrid mismatches. Hybrid mismatches can lead to double deductions for the same expense or deductions for an expense without any corresponding receipt being taxable. The Government has consulted in this area and is amending the rules in several uh, areas of it so that they remain proportionate and do not lead to economic double taxation. 
That includes introducing a limited grouping matching rule and a change to the type of income that counteractions under the rules can be set off against. Amendments 17 to 42 have been tabled by the Government to Clause 36 in order to ensure that the changes provided uh, for under that clause work and reflect the underlying policy intent. They address various technical issues that have been raised by external commentators following the publication of the legislation in the Finance Bill, mostly changing small and technical details. Clause 41 will close the loophole in the capital gains tax gift holdover relief rules by preventing non-UK residents from being able to claim the relief while transferring a business asset to a company controlled overseas, which they personally own. By making this change, the government is ensuring that the relief is used fairly and only for its intended purpose. Clause 117 and Schedule 29 make changes to the Promoters of Tax Avoidance Schemes regime, known as POTAS. The changes allow Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to issue stop notices to prevent the promotion of schemes that they suspect do not work and to obtain information from suspected promoters at an earlier stage of the process than at present. They also prevent promoters from sidestepping the rules by rearranging their corporate structure to carry out activities through different entities. And there are a number of other technical amendments to ensure the continued effectiveness of the regime. These are further me- there, are further, further me- there are further measures in the Bill to enhance the operation of the DOTAS Disclosure of Tax Avoidance Schemes rules as well. Clause 119 changes the penalties issued to enablers of tax avoidance schemes that have been defeated in court, at tribunal or otherwise counteracted. The changes will allow HMRC to obtain relevant information from potential enablers at the earliest possible moment so as to be able to consider whether they are liable for an enabler penalty. Clause 120 and Schedule 31 make changes to ensure that the general anti-abuse rule, known as the GAR, can be used as intended in respect of partnerships that have entered into abusive tax avoidance arrangements. Uh, Finally, turning to Clause 121, which from uh, April 2022 makes the renewal of certain licences to trade conditional on licence applicants in England and Wales completing checks with HMRC, these checks will confirm whether applicants are registered for tax and new licence applicants will be directed to HMRC guidance about their tax uh, operations, uh, uh, sorry, tax obligations. Uh, If I may, I want to come now to uh, the most substantive of the amendments that have been put in front of us uh, today, and that is Amendment 77, which relates to the POTAS clause that I have outlined. Amendment 77 seeks to amend Schedule 27 to this Bill so that anyone subject to the promoters of tax avoidance schemes regime and promoting or enabling abusive tax arrangements should be deemed to have been acting, should be deemed to have been acting dishonestly unless they can show they acted in good faith and believe the arrangements to be reasonable. This would mean, in respect of the criminal offence of cheating the public revenue, that a person would automatically be treated as dishonest where it had been demonstrated that they had promoted abusive tax arrangements as defined in the general anti-abuse rule. As such, there would be no requirement for any prosecution to prove dishonest conduct. Mr Chair, uh, I fully agree that promoters who break the law should face the consequences of their actions. That is why we are putting so much emphasis on anti-avoidance and anti-promoters of tax uh, avoidance measures in this bill and elsewhere as a government. We should be under no illusions about this. It is not honest to market tax schemes or arrangements which are known not to work and which at their heart feature false statements. But the offence of cheating the public revenue is the most serious tax offence. It carries a potential sentence of life imprisonment. It is therefore right that the prosecution should have to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt, the usual standard of proof in a criminal case, and that it should demonstrate that the person has been dishonest in order to secure a conviction of cheating the public revenue. We all want fraudulent operators to be brought to book. But shifting the burden of proof for such a serious crime onto the defendant to prove their innocence is at odds with the principles of our criminal justice system and would undermine the right of a defendant to remain silent. The burden should be on the prosecution to prove dishonesty to the criminal standard of proof. That is fundamental to the rule of law. Mr Chair, having said that, I therefore move that Amendments 17 to 42 are made to Clause 36 and that Clauses 30, 36, 41, 115 and 117 to 121, as well as Schedules 6, 7, 27 and 29 to 32, stand part of the Bill. The question is that Clause 36.